The day I killed someone for the first time, I was 10 years old. The war in Democratic Republic of Congo holds the reputation of being the deadliest in modern African history. It is known that more than six million people died from this war in Congo, dear. There is a pocket of activity where this unrestrained evil is producing a degree of suffering and pain and hardship and trauma that's beyond the scope of what we're even seeing in other parts of the world. Rebels came. They make war. They are going in the villages. They are killing persons. They kidnapped many young girls and many young men with them to the bush. They would take the women out into the forest and rape them. And if someone found a woman that he liked, he would keep her as his wife. This land, covered with molten rock and lava, seems to cry out for every man, woman, and child an entire nation suffering from war. When we see people that are traumatized, we are discouraged. They're hurt, their sense of feeling abandoned when, you know, you know how long, oh Lord, are you gonna let this go on? When I was 10 years old, rebels came to our village. They always attacked and looted at night. Emmanuel represents just one of the roughly 30,000 children kidnapped during the war in the Democratic Republic of Congo and trained to kill. They attacked us and kidnapped me and forced me to go into the woods. That's where we lived. That's where they started teaching us how to be soldiers in their army. Soldiers also kidnapped and raped young girls. When they came to my village, they said it was a must for all of us to join. All girls and boys became soldiers. We were forced to go. I was 14 years old and in secondary school when they took us away. Have been taken and brought in the bush to serve those uh, rebels by cooking, by doing other activities for those rebels. When he was 10 years old, rebels kidnapped John from school. They forced him to walk in the jungle for days, taking him further and further away from home. They asked who wanted to go home and who wanted to go with them. Some said they wanted to go back home. Those that raised their hands to go home were shot right there and then. The rest of us were terrified. They killed four kids right in front of me. Then they taught us how to steal, to kill, and how to attack others. We learned smoking, to smoke pot and many other evil things. They taught us every evil thing you can imagine. I remember the first person I ever shot and killed. I watched him fall. At that moment, I felt something change within me. A battle scar on his face doesn't begin to describe the scarring he feels on the inside. The person inside me changed completely. I wasn't able to sleep. All I could think about was how I killed that man, how I saw his blood flowing. 
At first, I would fall asleep at night and wake up terrified. His face kept flashing before me and the pictures of fighting and killing other people. I just couldn't sleep anymore. In order to survive his four-year captivity, Emmanuel learned to suppress his conscience. But as we continued training and singing as we trained, things changed, and killing people was no problem. It's not like we taught ourselves to kill. It was what they taught us. They would bring a person to you and give you a gun or another weapon to kill them. They would tell us to kill the person, and if you said you couldn't, they would kill you instead. I met one of the child and he told me that he has been able to kill 100 people, 200 people. I watched people die like wild animals, and when you saw their blood, that became your secret. One day, they killed my colonel, our leader. I took his things and tried to leave, and they beat me up really bad. They told me I could never tell anyone about those that we killed. No one was allowed to talk about the killings. Rape is one of the weapons of war used here. The United Nations declared the Democratic Republic of Congo, or the DRC, as the worst place in the world for a woman to live. In many places in Africa where rape is used as a weapon of war, it is very bizarre, very, very advanced, very sick kinds of rape. It is a way of taking them down psychologically. Mama. A psychological impact that nearly overwhelmed Sister Alvera Niira Masuhuko, who founded the Flame of Love Orphanage, located here in the heart of Goma. I began in 2007 with the goal of helping children who became orphans because of the war. But then I saw there was an incredible need to care for widows and women who were raped. During the war in Congo, more than 400,000 women ages 15 to 49 were raped, the equivalent of over 1,000 women every day, 48 women every hour, or four women every five minutes. They pointed the gun at my face. I felt like I was going to die. I was so scared. Then everything turned black until my friends took me outside. I didn't know what had happened to me. Soldiers raped 35-year-old Maria and left her to die. When they were done assaulting me, I was in so much pain and was sad. I fell down to the ground because my body was so weak. After that, I experienced many different illnesses. And by the time they brought me here to Goma, I couldn't even walk. I came here in search of medicine and because I was running away from my enemies. We partnered with a local hospital to provide care for the women who were raped. We helped them with medicine and we also taught them the Bible. In most rape cases, women carry an additional burden. Their husbands, unable to cope with the trauma, often reject them. The husbands, of course, are, are affected as well because they, they now have a real problem in their marriage. There is their wife who they feel is now polluted. They might accuse her of having wished to be raped or having brought this into their home in one way or another. 
There are times when I want to run away, especially when my husband is suffering. I feel like packing my things and escaping. Thirty-five-year-old Melania also escaped to Flame of Love. She says that her husband accepts her, but she vividly remembers the day when soldiers destroyed her home. They had brought knives and guns when they came into my house. They divided up. Some went where the children were, and the others came to me. But rape wasn't Melania's only trauma. As a result of her assault, she contracted AIDS. With a disabled husband at home, Melania ran to flame of love as a last resort. Even though we have little, we share with those who don't have anything. Sister Alvera provides medical help and support in finding a job. For example, I know that she doesn't have anything, so I give her a small loan to plant her garden or a kilo of beans to prepare a meal. I work on other people's farms. I wash clothes so that I can make some money. I just want to pay for my children to be able to go to school. It's very difficult, and there are some moments where I say, Lord, intervene for these people who are in misery. What will separate me from the love of Christ? Death, fear, distress, nothing will be able to separate me from the love of Christ. I have forgiven them. I pray and ask God to help soften their hard hearts and keep them from doing more evil. And I pray that he will provide me with a piece of land so that I can be with my children. Vicious warlords from over 20 rebel groups ignited this conflict, lasting two decades. They fought against various rising governments and divided the population between competing ethnic groups. These rebels fled to Congo with guns, and they stayed in Congo ghetto. They got organized and they start exploiting the natural resource of Congo to get more guns. And this had created a problem a lot for Congo. Like many African nations, Congo boasts natural resources like gold, diamonds, and rubber. But unique to this nation is coltan, an essential element in cell phones, laptop computers, and other electronic devices. Every militias and uh, rebel groups have been digging coltan because it has given them a lot of money and it has given them a lot of weapons to fight and kill people in Congo. But instead of creating wealth for the Congo, this black mineral ignited the bloodiest war in modern history. They were burning up schools, hospitals, medical centers, church buildings, and uh, they were burning also some people alive. Persons are dying because they don't have medicine at that time of war, because they don't receive the care that they really wanted. Care they needed, but never arrived. I didn't know that I was on the list of people who need to be killed. Even though his life was in danger, one man would not forget this war-torn land. I was born in Congo, but I grew up in Dungu, where my parents came from. Dr. Bagu Dekea Alubeo left the Democratic Republic of Congo with his family to study theology in the States. 
he intended to return. But when the 20-year war broke out, church leaders advised him to stay where he was safe, in America. His name was on the list of these militias of those that were to be in, eliminated. If he had returned then, his life would have been in severe danger. It looks like we need to verify the impact numbers just to make sure everything is correct. Okay. With little recourse or ability to help those at home, Bagu turned to his colleague, Dr. Robert Briggs, the executive vice president of the American Bible Society. People need to be providing food and people need to be providing aid and, and we need enterprise development, we need business investment in the region. But the American Bible Society is focusing on this issue of biblical trauma healing because we know that that's what will open the door to the rest of what can be fruitful. But Briggs and his colleagues discovered that people here and around the world suffering from the aftermath of trauma could never connect with the Bible in their current state. Without addressing the issue of trauma, then much of the rest of the work of providing the Bible is in vain. The American Bible Society turned to the Bible itself for a guide to that needed trauma healing. You will give them courage. You will hear the cries of the oppressed and the orphans. We got started in the area of trauma so that people could be healed in their spirits and hear God's voice, hear that the scriptures clearly state that God is good, God is sovereign, God is powerful, God knows your condition even when you are suffering severely. You will judge in their favor so that mortal men may cause terror no more. That's the message we need to convey. That was really the genesis of our response to this issue of trauma. And it was really the church leaders on the ground calling to us. A call to comfort traumatized people. Together, these two co-workers took a delegation to find out how to help. I had mixed emotions. I was... Uh, sad in a way that I had to take American people to the war zone. And the war zone was my country and my hometown. I was happy that I'm taking people who care about suffering people. They have lost family members. They have watched their loved ones being attacked. While in the DRC, they met with Reverend Christoph Congo Kote. As a Bible society, we work so that we can give the word of God to people. But in this case, we start working to say, how can we apply this word of God to the life of people? Then we came to this a conclusion that we need to set a program of trauma healing. This is the beginning of the story. A story whose opening chapters were written by this woman, Dr. Harriet Hill, who lived in West Africa for 15 years as a Bible translator. As long as people are traumatized, they're preoccupied with the trauma. And so you might be teaching them how to do something, but not much of their brain is available at that point. <laughs> Trauma healing needs to go along with something like development, some way that can help respond to those daily needs of medicine, of income, of food, clothing, homes. When I see a traumatized person, I look at this person like a person that is living without hope. And this person is carrying many problems. Sometimes you can see the person who did not like to live. 
I remember when the rebels invaded my town. They shot me and I fell to the ground. There were dead bodies everywhere. I didn't want to die on the road, so I crawled over into a gutter where I thought I would take my last breath. Now, 14 years later, Philemon writes about his three days of terror, running and hiding in the forests with an untreated gunshot wound. He survived several attempts on his life, a horror that plays through his mind every day. At night, I still wake up from my nightmares. I dream about how I was left in the desert to die. After the nightmares, I can't sleep. I always get up. It's always like that. These nightmares are just one symptom of unaddressed post-traumatic stress disorder. People can have flashbacks where they feel like they're living it again. It's like a movie in his head. He is seeing the massacre over and over and over and over. He can hardly sleep. Philemon says he feels frightened, sad, and disconnected from society. All symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD. It's human suffering. <laughs> Margaret Hill works with Wycliffe Bible translators across the continent of Africa. She too shows concern for people traumatized by war. People who are seriously traumatized are having a totally miserable life. They're not able to do a normal job. They're either a menace to their family, or at least they're not functioning properly within the family. Philemon lives alone. He's unable to handle everyday tasks, keeping him from holding a regular job or providing for a family. The trouble with people who have been traumatized is that they cause war wherever they are, because traumatized people can cause mayhem. Uh, often the people who rape and abuse others are actually traumatized. That's quite a common thing that happens. In a country in which 50% of its citizens suffered from these symptoms, Harriet wondered how to help. I had been involved in Bible translation and the question was, you know, what does the Bible have to say in this kind of situation? How do we help people, you know, who have experienced that kind of trauma? Harriet discovered that Margaret asked similar questions. We don't understand why are people behaving like this. We've got people committing suicide, we've got people being angry, we've got much more violence in the home, we've got a lot of conflict within our church. Harriet and Margaret, coincidentally with the same last name and a shared passion, began to meet with other church leaders to search for a way to help. Like Harriet, Margaret began to realize that people must work through their suffering before they can connect with the Bible. There are a lot more conflicts in churches where the leaders have been traumatized. Once they healed, they're much more able to work out good ways of working together. She was the one who said some men think if they don't beat their wives, then their wives think they don't love them. And everybody said, ah, but that was a cultural <laughs> suggestion, yeah. yes. Yeah. And I said to them, well, think of the things that they've been seeing. They've seen people being killed. They've seen women being raped. They've had their houses burnt down. It's affecting them. Trauma can be due to war, but even without war, a lot of people are living in a war zone. Mm -hmm. They're hurting in their hearts. And if you help them, then some of these behavior problems will, will go away. This is the, the big point today. Mm -hmm. So you, you can't know exactly the level mm -hmm. of the violence in families. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, people hide it. 
In a country where people struggle to find decent food and clean water, locating a good psychologist, let alone psychological resources for an entire community, is almost impossible. People with trouble will go to their pastor. The pastor can help them if they need more care. He could refer them to a counselor, but they will probably not go direct to a counselor. It's just not the done thing. They trust their pastor. But pastors often misunderstand trauma symptoms. Sometimes when these things happen, they think, you know, depending on the kind of church they go to, they have demons, they need to be delivered. One of the pastors here said, now that we understand the effects of trauma and how to help people recover from trauma, there will be a lot less exorcism of demons. After hearing a myriad of stories of suffering from untreated trauma symptoms, Harriet and Margaret joined forces on an experimental project. Quelles sont les raisons pour lesquelles on a le day? Today, we are going to be talking about grief. Now, why would we be grieving? Today, in this workshop, they equip leaders with practical exercises to address the needs of living in and working with the traumatized. Yes. And we grieve when we have lost our country, if you have to go to another country. Certainly, one grieves if you have been raped. That's very important, too. Together, they wrote a guide to train community leaders and pastors to reach out to the hurting Congolese people. We also grieve when we've lost all our belongings. Yes, and I know it has happened to many people here. Yes? They need to know that the Bible as well is teaching the same thing. Good mental health principles are reflected in the Bible. And it's perfectly possible to find Bible verses to support what we're teaching about mental health. If you come to Africa with a simple mental health, even if you're a psychiatrist, it is not satisfying in many, for many Africans because it's got to have the God part. It's got to have the spiritual component. It's got to be holistic in the sense of including uh, faith and hope and, and, and the Bible for Christians. Margaret and Harriet, both former Bible translators, demonstrate how the concepts found in the scriptures do translate into real healing. People resonate very much with this because they may have been told, just stuff it, you're a Christian, get on with it. But when they see that even in the Bible, people expressed how they felt to God, it gives them freedom to do so. So you've spent some time in this village of no hope. You've been very sad, not wanted to get out of bed in the morning, not wanted to do... So we came up with the idea of it, grief is like a journey going through three different villages. But you don't stay there very long, maybe a day, maybe a week, but then you're ready to go back to the village of new beginnings because... We talked about the village of denial and anger, which uh, is the first place you go after a, a loss. The village of no hope, where you might stay for quite a while, and then the village of new beginnings. So this is a very normal process. And it is how we can grieve well, to recover from losses in life. It's very helpful to understand what is normal and what is not helpful, you know, what is a sign of that there is a problem. I never studied trauma healing. I studied theology. Theology helps us gain insight. I don't cry because I'm strong. I need to be an example to my people. <laughs> The problem with the false bridge, that idea, is that it doesn't work. You never get to the village of new beginnings. Trauma healing helps us learn to talk to someone that is going through a tough time and learn how to help them. It doesn't mean we don't have faith. In fact, it means we do have faith because we're addressing them to God. And it's a plea for him to look. It's a plea for him to respond because we think he can. This trauma healing session teaches leaders how to first heal themselves so they can then go into the community to help others.
Before, when I tried to help people, I used the Bible simply to try to comfort people. But since I learned about the principles of trauma healing, I now have a better understanding of how to help people. And I can also teach these techniques to others. They told me that all the people that were within the church had been burned to ashes. Riziki was a victim of the war. In her case, they burnt everything. She had to escape with her family by running away. After they arrived and were welcomed at a certain church, the rebels came and burnt that down too. With the help of God, she was the only one who miraculously escaped that attack. So how are you feeling now, especially given the trauma that you've been through? It still breaks my heart to know that my family was lost and that all my neighbors were killed too. I then told her many stories of others who had suffered and helped her to realize she was not alone. She told me she had found a child who had also survived, whose parents were burned to death in the church here in Goma. I was with my mother when soldiers invaded our town. There was bullets flying everywhere. They grabbed us, but slaughtered some and burned the rest of the people in our village. We managed to escape. After their escape from the village, soldiers captured this 35-year-old Solange and tortured and killed her mother. I counseled both of them and comforted them. I continued to remind them that others had suffered in the same way they had. The cure for trauma is, on a very basic level, is so simple it's hard to believe. And that is letting people tell their story. I have seen so much violence, but I hope and pray for another journey. I believe in God's intervention and I know he will help me. Helping them feel safe, that their story isn't gonna to be told throughout the whole church or community, that uh, they aren't gonna to be told they shouldn't feel that way, uh, they should, uh, you know, have faith, not be angry. Sharing in song with other leaders in his community allows Pastor Kahiwa to release his own pain. The songs remind us that there's a time for war and a time for peace a time to plant and a time to harvest, a time of hardship and a time of rest. The songs help to relieve the burden inside of me. To date, over 900 facilitators in the Democratic Republic of Congo participate in the Bible Society's program. And over half a million people from this war-torn land have benefited so far. We live in a fallen world. There is death, there is illness, there is violence. And I mean, no one is spared really. People don't need to live in a war zone to understand the universal language of trauma. People living in war zones can recover from the trauma that they have experienced. We can take hope that there's a way for us to make it through our problems as well. So we're going to look at... Um, as the American Bible Society began to do a lot more advocacy for trauma healing in East Africa, people began to say, well, what about us? We are traumatized too. Erle is very angry, very angry and he is not gonna forgive this creep, Keith. 
So there's trauma overseas in war zones, but there's also a lot of trauma in the U.S. in the form of domestic violence, a lot of shooting, gangs, drug abuse, substance abuse, domestic abuse. He wants to do some of those jumping jacks. He heard about to respond to these needs, Harriet initiated trauma healing education for pastors and leaders working in Philadelphia's inner city. Sometimes we don't know how bitterness affects us. It intrigued me initially because I got to thinking about trauma in my own life. And I thought about some of my childhood experiences that I felt might have been traumatizing, and I didn't even know it. Trauma Healing Education equips Reverend Keith Williams to provide the support his inner city congregation desperately needs. I knew I had a congregation of people that had experienced trauma in their lives. I don't want to be bothered. You hurt me, yeah. leave you alone. Isolation from the person. We are teaching the same materials that we teach in Congo or Rwanda or other parts of the world as we're teaching here. You never get into conflict because we don't want to deal with forgiveness. So there are some universal themes, the themes of loss, the themes of hurt, the themes of woundedness. That is so important. According and to Dr. Philip Monroe, that trauma I, is the emotional burden we carry after experiencing a painful like a event. And so therefore, I'm going to hold out. They wonder, did they deserve this? They become angry and distrustful of other people. They become angry and distrustful of themselves. There's a lot of self-loathing. I think you're actually becoming stronger by not asking forgiveness or apologizing, but you're really becoming more right. There's a lot of denial about trauma. There's a lot of prevalent pushing things down, stuffing our feelings, stuffing our reactions. They may know that God has forgiven them. They may know it here, but they don't experience it. But they're still filled with guilt and shame over it, and they can't let it go. Unresolved trauma creates havoc in families and can also produce an economic burden on society like a wound on your body. It's a, like a physical wound. And if you don't treat a physical wound, it gets worse. You can't ignore it. Just because you're ignoring it doesn't mean it's going away. And trauma is very, very similar. Today, we call that post-traumatic stress disorder. The person often loses heart. They wonder where God is. If, and so you just see lots of ongoing anxiety and depression, almost ping-ponging back and forth. Studies show that PTSD changes the brain chemistry in the sufferer, and women can carry symptoms to their unborn children. Without healing, the trauma may manifest its symptoms for generations. We've seen this in Rwanda where children born after the genocide are experiencing some of the same symptoms of their parents who went through the genocide. It actually changes something in your brain. We see it in Holocaust families. The third generation of their children are experiencing many problems that may in fact be the result of things that their, their families experienced. It is possible that us in the African American community can be feeling the effects of slavery passed down from generation to generation, all the way back to the separation of the families. The trauma and the bitterness doesn't come like with a big sign on your head that, you know, now I'm traumatized. Even like And so that's little by little how our brains heal, how we heal of trauma. It's by telling somebody about it. Whether here in America or abroad in Africa, this program equips leaders to understand the symptoms and the steps to real healing. This is it's, uh, Placide de Mahoro. Placide de Mahoro. He came back, he was being at Peace Leaf Center, and now he's working, uh, wood, uh, do, doing some activities. He's already integrated in society, helping people, but living at Peace Leaf Center. David and Jeremy, who work here, remember every young man and woman who has lived at Peace Live Center. This is uh, Ajuangira and he has been in a troop of Nyatura, uh, Nyatura for Nyatura uh, 11, 11 uh, months. Their goal? 
to help former soldiers reintegrate back into society. Anne still remembers the day she escaped from her captors. I prayed to God that one day something would happen that would make all of us leave that dreadful place. And God helped me because the government forces raided the camp and we all ran away and we were dispersed. We went and met at Masisi, but we found that they burned down our village and that's why we came here. Although she feels safe here, Anne still fears the soldiers and the thought of capture and imprisonment once again. I am still fearful. Whenever I am in a place, every time I see a soldier or the green uniform coming my way, even from far off, I turn around and walk the other way. I don't want to look him in the eye because I know he could be ruthless. She came here so that she can be healed and serve and forgot all those things that she saw when she was with the rebels. John and Emmanuel eventually ran away from their captors and found refuge in United Nation trucks driving through town. Most of the time, those children are not accepted because they are saying that they are rebels and they can do bad things. And since the uh, situation is uh, uh, horrible, they become street boys and in, because they are not accepted in the community. Mbele. I walk past my village and they're not there. It's not like home. The people disowned me. He was unable to go back in his family. And then he came to us to ask how we could help him. He said, at my home, there is still war. If I go there, they will take me again. They asked, how can you help us? You remember things you saw or did when you were in the wild. When you remember these things, you begin to ask yourself if these things really happened or if they are just thoughts. It's like a dream. Many former child soldiers find a home here at Peace Live Center, where its leaders implement biblical trauma healing principles. So instead of letting them stay in the streets, we take them, we start teaching them Bible, healing them the, the trauma, and just teaching them how to become a peacemakers. They were fierce because they came freshly from the bush and they had the spirit of vengeance, the spirit of violence. When I began to create the center, I was afraid of not achieving my assigned objective. Trauma healing at Peace Live Center first begins by allowing children to share their fears and experiences with caring counselors. When we receive a new child here at the center, we listen to him as that is his greatest need. It's necessary that he tell us his story. How did he get kidnapped? What did they force him to do? And then we can help him depending on his degree of trauma. Hello, friends. After counseling, these former child soldiers participate in Bible classes to learn how to depend on their faith to forget their past and live for the future. The bad things has going on and you have become, you start a new life, new life in the world, in the Lord. So God has a good plan for you. The, the second program is teaching them peace. We teach about how they can forgive others and understand that they can be forgiven, and then how they can build peace in their village. The teachings on trauma are really helping me. As they were teaching us, I took notes. When I feel lonely, I go through them. These notes help to remind me and help me to understand that I am in a time of healing of restoration. Sometimes I call the other girls and put them up in groups, then teach them on how to face trauma as I was taught. Forgiveness for John did not mean forgetting. He struggles every day remembering the savage life he lived in the jungle. Sometimes I'm still shocked when I remember how I was kidnapped during the war. 
He was disappointed to see what he has done before, and when he came, he was just thinking every time and dreaming about what he has done. Mbele. Earlier on, I didn't want to talk to anyone because I felt like I was going crazy. Now we've learned to talk about these things with others. By talking, we learn to get these thoughts out of our head. Finally, creative activities facilitate healing. Here, these peacemakers express their faith through song. They express their feelings through illustrations and act out both the pain of their past and their hope for the future on stage. <laughs> They were showing how they were students before going in the bush. You saw them wearing white clothes and a blue, so it's the uniform school. So they showed that they were first at school. While at school, they all were friends. And from that time, they have been taken by rebels. Out of the suffering that these children have survived, they are now able to compose these songs and act out these dramas. While they reenact and remember their capture and forced activities while imprisoned, Humor allows them to tell their stories in a way that reassures their audience. They committed serious mistakes and even crimes in their villages. Now, even though they are not welcome there, they are trying through their presentations to make peace with the people in their communities. The comedy is letting them be not afraid and so that community may not be afraid and themselves may not be uh, afraid or ashamed or thinking about something bad. <laughs> Through this original drama, these former war children hope their communities will accept them once again and believe that fearless boy soldiers can transform into genuine peacemakers. They are trying to show the community that peace is possible when we ask God to re-establish peace. They want to be able to return to their normal lives, even return to school, to traits and activities that they have left behind. Recently, though, I am beginning to see the fear become less strong as I am healing. May God help you as you want to go. We will stay praying. May God. Though Sister Alvera cares for hundreds of women, she says that Flame of Love exists first for the orphans, often the most neglected casualty of the war. Children are really seriously traumatized in many of these situations in Africa, and adults don't even think about them, although the child may be even more traumatized than the adult. But it hurts them inside. And so as parents and as mamas, we need to know how to come to our children and help them. Today, Harriet and Margaret teach mothers how to recognize the signs of trauma in their children. Children also, in times of war, in times of poverty, see that their parents, especially if they have a single mom as a parent, they don't have a father, they see that their mother is overwhelmed. 
and they don't want to hurt their mother with yet another trouble. When our children go through trauma, we can't say, go away, go play, go away, be quiet. We have to listen. We have to listen. So children tend to keep secrets. And it's only when we know how to listen to our children that they feel safe enough to share some of the things that they've experienced. We can let the tears come out and the child might cry. It's okay. Many children have been sexually abused and keep it a secret because they don't want to hurt their parents. Melania now realizes that recovery for her family means paying attention to her children's secret hurts. They are also wounded inside. I keep telling them to come back home, but they refuse. And through singing, Melania identifies with a biblical promise of better days ahead. The words of the song speak of a people going to Canaan, to the promised land of forgiveness for our sins. Yes, it helps me a lot. There is the example of Job and how he suffered. In the end, God blessed him. One of the lessons to learn is how can we continue to love Christ even if we are suffering. It is difficult to manage, but the lesson is that Christ is still there helping us. It's a lesson that must begin with what many would consider the impossible. It started by the forgiveness. If people experience the forgiveness, then they are free. And then their faith is built and they, they can receive peace from there. It helps them to, to live. Jeremy found a church that would take in his young men and women who need to hear a message of love. We work in partnership with the church. We teach the children before anything to first believe in Jesus Christ, to know that even if they've committed acts of violence, even if they have made mistakes, God is there to forgive them. This shocked me and I realized that I was evil and I had killed many people. But every time I did that, I would pray and ask God to forgive me, to clean me. Emmanuel, however, still confuses his role as victim for which he must forgive his perpetrators and his role as a soldier for which he must forgive himself. I asked him how God could accept me after all I had done. I had killed and I had already decided that I could never be good again. I told him that God could never accept me because I had done so many bad things. He asked people to forgive him and he was asking, can people forgive me? We told him they are ready to forgive you and God have already forgive you. 
ningeomba wa young peacemakers vijana wote wa young peacemakers kwenye wanakuwa hapa ama pale wasimame this young man who once committed the darkest of crimes now expresses an inner freedom through song First, they are healed against the trauma. Secondly, they are going to be the ambassadors of peace, and they will help local leaders to build their community. Those undergoing trauma healing in the Congo are learning to walk toward the village of new beginnings. There is a hope for change in the community, change in the churches, change in the leadership. There is a hope for Congo. Without the biblical trauma healing intervention, there's very little else that can be done to help the people in the region. They need to be healed from this trauma so that they can believe for a better day tomorrow. There is healing that comes from Christ's death on the cross, and then bringing that pain to Christ and saying, Christ, please, you died for sin and everything sin entails. Please take this pain and bring healing to my heart. And uh, it's beautiful, yeah, it's beautiful. There will be peace in the valley for me. No trouble, I see. There will be peace, peace in To purchase a DVD of this program, call 877-908-5433.